Gentlemen, how much am I offered for this beautiful lace Dresden china figurine? A lady of the French court. Now, this is the genuine article. What a beautiful ornament for your mantelpiece. Or you could use it as a centerpiece on the dining room table. Now, will somebody start me for ten pounds? Will somebody start me for ten pounds? Eight pounds. Seven pounds. All right, five. Five pounds is offered, five pounds is offered, five pounds is offered. Five pounds ten, five pounds fifteen, five pounds fifteen. Six pounds is offered, six pounds, six pounds, going once, going twice, the third and the last call will be all done. Sold to the lady from Twickenham for six pounds. Next, we have a real museum piece, ladies and gentlemen. A fine 19th century doll. A costume and exact replica of the holiday clothes worn by the Hungarian peasant women. Now, ladies and gentlemen, an article like this will cost you from 15 to 20 pounds in a West End shop. I'm not going to ask you for anything like that. We'll give me two pounds for it. Two pounds. Anybody offer me two pounds? Two pounds for the hunk? The area? Two pounds? One pound. One. Anybody give me one pound? Anybody offer me one pound for the doll? One, one pound is offered, ladies and gentlemen. One pound is offered. Now, I'm not going to waste your valuable time or mine in trying to get one half of what this beautiful doll is worth. If the young lady can steal it for one pound, that's her good fortune. So it's going once, it's going twice, the third and last call. Any more? Sold to the young lady for one pound. And now, ladies and gentlemen, may I draw your attention to something which may be a great surprise to you, worthy of any collection. The only other one like it is in the British Museum. It's a Ming vase of the Seventh Dynasty. This vase lay in a large collection somewhere outside Rome for over two centuries, I understand. It was discovered there by the noted antiquarian Sir Andrew Copleston. Now, some of you may remember Sir Andrew Copleston. Besides being a noted traveler and antiquarian, he's also a gentleman rider. girl with a parcel in her hand. Is that her? Are you sure that's the girl? Well, she fits perfectly the auctioneer's description. Follow her, Hamid. Dear. And only one pound. We can get at least three for it. Easily. I'll go make some tea. I could do with a cup. Right. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. I'm looking for a birthday gift for a seven-year-old girl. What would you suggest? We have some lovely dolls. Now, this Hungarian... I think she has enough dolls already. Books are always welcome. Well, I'm looking for something a little different. Well, that's rather cute. Uh, what is it? Well, that's a musical box. Children always love them. And this is an exceptionally nice one. It plays many tunes. Have you any others? Yes. If you'll just step this way. I have only two left. How oh, nice. Are you sure this is all you have? I'm sorry. They're rather hard to find, you know. That's our entire allotment. I did have one other, but I sold it earlier this afternoon. But it was only a plain wooden one. It wouldn't have been a very nice gift for a child. Really? Do you happen to know who the purchaser was? Why, yes. He left his card, just in case anyone should inquire for him. How interesting. I'm sorry, but I'm afraid I'll have to look a bit further. Thank you, anyway. Uh, good afternoon. Thank you.
Harvey! Follow that cab. Here now, what? Scotland Yard. Hop in. Sherlock Holmes, I might have known. We thought we were the hunters, instead of which we're the hunted. We've been fools. We played right into his hands. Of course. He's had us followed. Don't look. The man in front of the toy shop. Hummy, turn sharp right at the next corner and again at the next. No photograph of her, Commissioner, as I expected. She's not a known criminal. But how do you expect to know if you do find her? After all, she was disguised as, as a charwoman. Don't worry, old fellow. If I ever see her again, I'll recognize her. Well, it won't be long till we know who they are and from where they operate. Who's covering them? Uh, Sergeant Thompson's following them, sir. They won't get away from him. He's a good man. We could have arrested them at Clifford's toy shop if we had any proof. But we know that they killed Emra. Proof, my dear fellow. We must have proof. We have x-rayed it, sir. There's nothing whatever concealed in the box. We'll have a look at the plates. Hmm. There must be some clue. And it's probably so obvious that we've all overlooked it. Seems to me we're up against a bunch of lunatics. Not lunatics, my dear fellow. Extremely astute, cold-blooded murderers. What can these little musical boxes have in them that's so important? Don't forget, they were made in Dartmoor prison. You can smuggle stuff into prison, but not out. Do you want us to break the box apart, sir, to see if there's anything the X-ray hasn't caught? No, not yet. Do you mind if I take it? Certainly. Thanks. The governor of Dartmoor Prison informed us, sir, in answer to Mr. Holmes' uh, question, that all three musical boxes were made by the same convict, John Davidson, serving a seven-year term, sir. Davidson? The Bank of England plates. That'll be all. Yes, sir. Now we're getting somewhere. If... Wait a minute. How did you know about the plates, Mr. Holmes? I'm a student of crime, Inspector. I make it my business to know about such things. And when the name of Davidson was mentioned... Well, who is this fellow Davidson? As long as Mr. Holmes seems to know all about it already, I suppose there's no harm in telling you. Uh, two years ago in London, there occurred a robbery of such tremendous importance, uh, although the stolen articles themselves have no intrinsic value whatsoever, that the Home Secretary was instrumental in seeing that not a word of it appeared in any newspaper. But you never told me anything about this, Holmes? You were away at the time. Articles of no intrinsic value and yet of such importance? <laughs> I don't understand. Davidson was apprehended within 15 minutes of committing the theft. But by that time, he'd hidden the articles in question and they've yet to be found. Before going further, Dr. Watson, I must inform you that this matter is not to be mentioned outside of this room. Of course not. Do I look like a man who'd gossip? Let's not go into that now, old fellow, shall we? Davidson had been employed for years in a position of extreme trust by the engravings department of the Bank of England. The articles he stole were nothing less and a complete duplicate set of plates for printing five-pound notes. What? The Bank of England's own plates? Precisely. And with those plates, a gang of crooks could flood England with five-pound notes, not forged in the usual sense of the word, but notes undetectable from genuine Bank of England notes in any way whatsoever. Good heavens. Any whisper at all might have resulted in enormous damage in shaking public confidence in the Treasury. We tried everything after we arrested Davidson. Offered him a shorter sentence if he'd tell us where he'd hidden the plates. Why, we even put in Scotland Yard men with him as cellmates, but no results. Obviously, Davidson is a man of strong character and infinite patience. Yet suddenly he feels impelled to smuggle out the secret of the hiding place of the plates to his confederates. Why? I don't understand, Mr. Holmes. Well, for example, has the Bank of England made any plans to radically change the design of the five pound notes so that in, say, uh, seven years from now, notes made from the stolen plates would be worthless? Confidentially, Mr. Holmes, such a move was discussed. But replacing all the five pound notes in circulation would be such a Herculean task that nothing's been done about it as yet. I see. 
Of course, there is another possible explanation. Davidson didn't have much time to find a hiding place before he was captured. He may be afraid that the plates will be accidentally discovered before he's released. Hence his anxiety to communicate their whereabouts to his confederates as soon as possible. I believe you hit it, Mr. Holmes. I'm sure that the message is contained in this musical box. Or rather, in all three musical boxes, since possession of all three seems to be essential. Our opponents have two-thirds of the puzzle, we have one-third. Well, what are you going to do, Holmes? Try to deduce the message from the one-third that we have. The same tune as the one played by Emery's musical box. And yet it's different. It sounds the same to me. The tune. Somehow the tune is the key to the mystery. It must be the tune. Otherwise, why use three musical boxes to convey the message? Why not collar boxes or shoe boxes? Yes? It's for you, Inspector. Oh, thank you, sir. Inspector Hopkins speaking. What? Where? Golders Green Station reports they've just found Sergeant Thompson's body. From the tire marks on his clothes, he was apparently run over by a taxi. What an unfortunate accident. Not an accident, my dear fellow. I'm afraid it's murder. Place. A rendezvous for actors. Actors? <clears throat> Buskers, old boy. You've seen them a thousand times. Actors who entertain the queues, waiting outside theaters. Dr. Watson, Joe's sister. Oh, well, any friend of Mr. Holmes is a friend of mine. Hi, oh, Joe. He did me a good turn once that I'll never forget. Yes, I cleared Joe of a most unpleasant charge. Murder, no less. Oh, really? By proving to the satisfaction of the police that he was busy at the time, blowing open someone's safe. That's right, Governor. Good gracious me. Uh, Joe, uh, now you can help me. Come on, buzz off, buzz off. Come on, off it, off it. Can a gentleman have some peace and quiet around here? You too. There you are, Mr. Holmes. Now we can have some peace and quiet around here. Thank you, Joe. There's five pounds in this for you. 
Well, I wouldn't want to take it on myself, sir. But I can get somebody to do it for you for half of that. You don't know what the job is yet. For five pounds? Murder, ain't it? What? No, you're not murder, just uh, music. I want you to identify a song for me. Oh, there ain't a song that's been written that I don't know. That's why I came to you. Of course, the violin is more my instrument, but, um... Oh, well. Here we go. Now, listen to this, Joe. Wait a minute. You're playing that wrong. That should be E natural, not E flat. You know the song? Oh, yes. It's an old Australian song called, uh, The Swagman. But you're playing it all wrong. That's what I hoped you'd say. Now, listen again, Joe. the same tune, all right, but you're making different mistakes than you did the first time. No, not mistakes, Joe. Call them variations. Here, play the song for me. We'll know the way it's written. What's it mean, Holmes? Are you onto something? Perhaps. I don't know yet. It's probably a code of some sort. Joe, could you write the song down for me? The way it was originally written? Oh, sure, Miss Downs. But it'll take a few minutes. Mm -hmm. Here, Mabel. Hey, Lail. Come on, off to it. Along with it. Obviously, it isn't the lyrics. No combination of those words made any sense at all. The variations in the way Emery's musical box played the tune are different from the variations in the one we have. You sure? Quite. You see, I took the trouble to memorize the tune as played by Emery's box that night we were with him in his flat. Oh, oh you amaze me. Let me mention, my dear fellow, one of the first principles in solving crime is never to disregard anything, no matter how trivial. But why are three boxes? Why not one? Because the message was obviously too long to be conveyed by any one variation. Then there's the third box. The one that woman took from the Kilgores. That contains yet another set of variations. Yes, well, it's all beyond me. Well, all we have to do now is to find the secret of the variations. Not a very easy problem to solve, my dear fellow. Hello. What's up? We've had company. I say, this is outrageous. Ask Mrs. Hudson to come in here, will you? Right. Mrs. Hudson? Yes? Oh, there you are. Will you come up here at once, please? Oh, coming, sir. me, Mr. Holmes. What has happened? Who called while we were out, Mrs. Hudson? Just a young lady. The one who said you wanted her to wait for you. And a nice-looking old gentleman with Our her. friends again, Watson. Friends? What did the young lady look like? Oh, I, I couldn't see her face. She had a, a heavy black veil on. But she had such a nice way with her. Oh, uh, I'm sorry, Mr. Holmes, if I've done anything wrong. But you did say I should always let clients come in and wait for you. Don't worry, Mrs. Hudson, don't worry. You had no way of knowing. It's quite all right, quite all right. Now, don't worry, Mrs. Hudson. Don't worry. Well, where on earth's the musical box? They didn't get it. Didn't get it? Where is it? It's in your hand. Huh? In the biscuit jar. Take the biscuits off the top. Now, put your hand inside, and you'll find the music box. Well done, Holmes. Well done. Amazing. <laughs> oh, 
Whew. Nice fresh smell. Like a pub after closing time. <laughs> I say, Holmes. What? It's morning. Allow me to congratulate you on a brilliant bit of deduction. Oh. It's not a transposition, not a polygraph transposition, not a trigraph, nor any known form of decoding. How about the Morse code? Have you tried that? Yes, at about three o'clock this morning. I'm oh, sorry, old man. I was only trying to help. I've heard that thing a thousand times. Can be awake all night. Not a very distinguished composition, I grant you. You know perfectly well I don't know one tune from the other. When I was a kid, my people tried to have me taught the piano. I've always felt sorry for that old teacher of mine. The poor old girl finally reached the point of numbering the keys for me. One, two, three, four. Even then, I, I never progressed beyond a, Number in the keys, Watson. The 19th key of the keyboard is the 19th letter of the alphabet. S. Here. Write it down when I give it to you, old fellow, will you? The first altered note. Write S first. Now, the eighth key is H. The fifth key, E. The twelfth key, L. The sixth key, F. S-H-E-L-F. Shelf. <laughs> Your piano lessons were not in vain, old fellow. You've solved it. Thank you. Uh, uh, oh, thanks, old man. Old <laughs> We now have two-thirds of the message behind books. Third shelf secretary, Dr. S. Presumably, these are the first and second portions of the message. And this gang has the first and third parts of it. Precisely. Then it's a stalemate? Yes, Commissioner, but we can't leave it like that. There's no doubt in my mind that they'll try to secure our third of the message that's missing. Well, I assume you've taken every precaution to guard the Clifford music. Oh, yes, it's carefully hidden at Baker Street with Dr. Watson on guard. However, I'm reasonably certain that, uh, difficult as it may be, we can find the plates even without the missing part of the message. Behind books, third shelf secretary, Dr. S. Well, outside of the fact that Davidson hid the Bank of England plate somewhere in London, Mr. Holmes, I don't see that we progressed at all. Allow me to point out to you, sir, the key words, Dr. S. It looks as if the plates were hidden in the house of the doctor. Whether S stands for his first or last initial remains to be determined by a process of elimination. Well, there must be 10,000 doctors in London with S for a first or last initial. Precisely. And every one of them will have to be questioned in person. That's why I say this is a task for Scotland Yard. It's a task, all right. But Scotland Yard has searched worse haystacks and found a needle. Well, for the time being, I'll leave the matter in your hands, gentlemen. We'll call you if and when we get a lead on our mysterious Dr. S. In the meantime, I intend to follow up a little clue concerning a cigarette. Mm. You're certain of the identification of the tobacco? Absolutely. I have made up this special blend for only three customers. It is almost pure Egyptian, mm -hmm. with admixture of Latakia for added body, and a pinch of Perique, merely a whisper, as one might say, for elusive fragrance. Yes, yes, and the, um, the three customers? Major Wilson in Bombay, India. Mm -hmm. Mrs. Catherine Leamington Smith mm -hmm. in Ireland. Yes, and the third? Mrs. Hilda Courtney of Park Mansions, Bryanston Square. Thank you. Thank you very much. You've been most helpful. It is a pleasure to have been of service, Mr. Holmes. Yes? Mrs. Courtney? Yes. Uh, my name is Sherlock Holmes. Oh, do come in. Thank you. I've heard of you, of course, Mr. Holmes. I believe we have a mutual friend in Sir Edward Brookdale. He's spoken to me of you quite often. Indeed. 
And to what good fortune am I indebted for this visit? I think you know, Mrs. Courtney. <laughs> well, I, I did get a summons for speeding last week. But outside of that, I don't think I'm of any interest to the police. Oh, come now, Mrs. Courtney. You seem to forget that you and I have met before. I'm sorry. I'm sure I would have remembered meeting the great Sherlock Holmes. Please sit down. Thank you. You say we met before. Yes. At the home of Mr. and Mrs. Kilgore, 143B Hampton Road. Kilgore? I don't think I know anyone of that name. Well, I didn't say you knew them. As a matter of fact, you called on them when they were out. I don't understand, Mr. Holmes. Really? And you were dressed rather differently. Indeed. Cigarette? Thank you. Thank you. You know, Mrs. Courtney, people generally forget, in assuming a disguise, that the shape of the ear is an almost infallible means of recognition and identification to the trained eye. Evidently, you've mistaken me for someone else. Oh, no, not at all. Though, naturally, I expected your denial. But when you paid your visit to my rooms at Baker Street, you carelessly left behind another identification. They're, uh, identical, aren't they? Yes, I must admit they are. You see, Mr. Holmes, to catch one as clever as you, I had to use a very special lure. I knew you'd be unable to resist the bait of my cigarette, having read with great interest your monograph on the ashes of 140 different varieties of tobacco. I should advise you not to move, Mr. Holmes. I must congratulate you on your ingenuity, Mrs. Courtney. It was indeed a brilliantly designed trap.